McMoy is front and center. Uh, this is uh, for my third hour class on the 25th of April. This little boy is front and center in this whole scheme of continuity. Uh, on him, to a large extent, depends the survival of the Russian monarchy, okay? And of course, the best kept secret in Russia, only his doctors and his family know about this, is that he has this dreaded disease called hemophilia. Now today, there are drugs and treatments of various sorts which allow hemophiliacs to live a pretty normal, natural life. But none of those things existed when this little boy was alive. And so he couldn't play tennis or ride a bicycle or do all the things that little boys did. Uh, and that was very frustrating to him. As I said to you yesterday, he, on one occasion he stomped his foot and he said, I'm next in line to be the ruler of all of Russia to his father. And I'm the only boy in Russia that can't have a bicycle. Okay. Well, in October of 1912, uh, the royal family was on vacation uh, in Poland. Okay, there's... Poland, right there. The royal Russian family was here on the seacoast in Poland, right? And the little boy was out playing, like little boys do, and he fell. Uh, and uh, immediately his mother, who was sitting there in a chair on the beach, I guess enjoy enjoying that, uh, ran to him. And by the time she got to him, he was unconscious. And he was reading, or, or he, would, uh, he uh, was literally bleeding, and uh, you could see the black ruptured, you know, what is a bruise on your arms when you and, and rupture blood vessels, and what happens? A dark spot appears. Well, they could see those spots appearing on him, and they uh, she immediately told, uh, they were out there with the carriage, she immediately picked the little boy up and ran to the carriage, and she told the carriage driver uh, to race to the palace where they were staying, and of course, uh, you know, the carriage would hit ruts and bumps, and every time, you know, more spots with a pure little boy and long story made short by the time they made it to the palace where they were staying he was dying in fact his condition was so serious that they called in a priest to give him the last rites or any of you roman catholic you know what last rites are r i not 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 r i g h t s but r i t e s in the catholic church there is a belief and by the way the catholic church is the largest christian church on earth uh, over a billion, uh, over a billion adherents. If you're raised in Oklahoma, you would think the Baptists are the largest Baptist denomination. Uh, it is Southern Baptist, which if you're a Baptist, I assume, because of where we are, you're a Southern Baptist, although there are all sorts of Baptists. But uh, there are only about 14 million of them as compared to a billion, over a billion Roman Catholics. But anyway, uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, there is a belief that... Uh, a Christian cannot go to hell. However, if a Christian dies with unconfessed sins, I'm not a Christian, but if I were, according to the Catholic Church, if I was rushing out here today and fell down the stairs and broke my neck, uh, and my last words were, damn it, before I'd fall, you know, well, that's profanity, that's a sin, and I wouldn't have time to confess that, so what happens to me? I'm a Christian with an unconfessed sin. What happens to me? Where are the two final destinations according to Christianity and those other religions? You're either going to heaven or hell. So what happens to me? What? No, you can't. You're a Christian. You can't go to hell. Christians don't go to hell. What's that? You have an unconfessed sin. So where do you go? Where do Christians go with unconfessed sins? Now, the Catholic Church, I'm not a Christian. The Catholic Church, no question about it. I'm going to hell, according to the Christians in general. But <laughs> what's the, what happens to you? You're, according to the, I'm just telling the Catholic Church. I'm not telling you it is true. There's a place called Purgatory. Okay? That's not a ski resort in Colorado. <laughs> Purgatory. And if you're a Christian and you've got an unconfessed sin, you, you go to this place called purgatory and you stay there. It's not hell, it's not heaven. And there are some punishments depending on the gravity of your sin. Okay. Probably if I just said damn, uh, I wouldn't be in purgatory very long. And on the other hand, if uh, I don't know, I you know, robbed the bank and did all sorts of other horse sold drugs and 
I died with it, you know, I'd probably be in, I could be in purgatory for 10,000 years, okay? But you stay there until you pay for your sin, and then off to heaven you go. Okay, that's why when you go to Ireland, by the way, which is a heavily Catholic country, you'll see the priest house, and they will have, beside the priest house, don't block this drive, because he never knows when he's going to get a call that out in the country, someone's great-grandmother's dying, and she wants to give her last confession. You've probably all seen these movies out of here where some gangster gets shot up and they'll bend down and say to him, Guido, what, what do you want? And he'll say, get a priest. I want to get my last confession here. So I'll go to purgatory. I'll tell you this, if you're ever in a horrible accident and all your friends are around you as they're rolling you in the emergency room, they're all saying, don't worry, you look great, you'll be fine. All of a sudden, somebody appears there, and they've got that purple collar around their neck, and they're doing the union here. You're finished. Anyway, you understand what the last rites are. It's the last confession of a dying Christian, okay? So anyway, this little boy's so sick. My point is, you know, and, and of course, I've got to make a lot of it. But, uh, you know, this is serious stuff to people who are Roman Catholics. Serious. And... Uh, you know, they don't just call the priest to get the last rites because you know, your sinuses are acting up one morning. They were convinced he's dying. So they called the priest, and he gave him the last rites, okay? Uh, and, of course, he continued to get worse. And his mother, who was a devoutly religious woman, is behind, by the side of his bed, almost just shrieking and praying, calling out these prayers to God to save her son. And there was a maid in the room. And, of course, I know today in the movies, the maids talk to royalty. A maid or a butler or someone like that wouldn't have said a word to the king or the queen of Russia unless they were spoken to first. But this maid felt sorry for it. She went to her and told her that she had a sister in St. Petersburg, which was the capital city of Russia, St. Petersburg, and a holy man had appeared in St. Petersburg, and he was known to have raised people from the dead. He could perform miracles. He was a priest. And, uh, you know, desperate time. If, if the little boy had been healthy and happy, probably no one would have paid any attention to this. But desperate times call for desperate measures. And so they placed the call back to St. Petersburg to this man, Grigory Rasputin. Write him down, Grigory Rasputin. No, oh, and there he is, Grigory Rasputin. Okay. He's called in history the Mad Monk. Okay, a monk is a priest, the mad, the crazy, I'm, not, I'm mad at you, the crazy lunatic priest. But, uh, you know, they said that he was a holy man, and so she, they placed a call through, and the Russian police went down and found this guy living in the slums of St. Petersburg and brought him to the royal palace, and, you know, there on the end of the phone is this mother screaming and shrieking, and, they hand the phone to Rasputin, and he said, you know, just kind of uh, feel bored by the whole thing. And finally, when she stops to catch her breath, he says, the little one will not die. Don't let the doctors bother him much. Click, I got the phone. Well, they cleared every doctor out of the room. And the little czar bitch lived. Now, why he lived, who knows? <laughs> Probably the doctors were poking and prodding and turning him trying to help him, trying to save his life, uh, but the blood couldn't, you know what I'm talking about, you know when it's, it's I talked about that, it didn't flow until the skin got really tight. Well, probably it, it, it could, that couldn't happen. And he it was continuing to bleed when they turned him. You understand what I'm talking about? Maybe, I'm not saying that's what, some people have said that, but for whatever reason, the little boy lived. He didn't walk for six more months, but he was alive. And that's what the Russian, oh, no, the mother knows her, her son's alive. That's her main concern. But the Russian monarchy's looking at this guy, and they say, he's alive. And as long as he's alive, the Romanov dynasty survives, survives. And from that moment on, get this down, the Tsarina became convinced that the life of her son was in the hands of Rasputin. And by the way, the life of her son is in the hands of Rasputin life of all of Russia, she believed, was in the hands of Rasputin. She, believed, she came to believe that Rasputin was a holy man 
sent by God to save the Romanov dynasty. And as soon as the royal family is back in St. Petersburg, they're going to move this guy into the royal palace. And anyone who criticized him in any way will be banished. The Tsarina gets rid of him. Well, of course, who was Rasputin? Number one, he wasn't a real priest. Okay, number two, he was certainly not a holy man. Number three, he was a semi-literate. He could read a little bit and sign his name, peasant, who had abandoned his wife and children, got tired of living out in the country, so he said, I'm going to go to the big city. Uh, he was a huckster. Uh, he was a fraud. Uh, his moral behavior was beneath contempt. He was a rapist. Uh, his personal habits were disgusting. He's about six foot two. Uh, he has long, greasy, matted hair, a long, greasy beard. One person I read said he probably only had two baths in his life, one on the day he was born and one on the day he died. But he is able because he convinces the Tsarina that the, son, the life of her son is in his hands. Get this down. He is able to amass an enormous amount of power. Like I say, his personal habits were literally disgusting. On one occasion, there was a banquet all of these Russian nobles were there. Uh, the ladies dressed in evening gowns and jewels, and Rasputin had a seat up at the front table with the Tsar. And uh, nobody would start to eat until the Tsar picked up his food first and ate the soup or whatever they were serving. Well, they were serving soup. It sounds horrible to me. The first course of the dinner that night was uh, fish soup. That's, uh, I can't think of anything much worse fish soup, and uh, Rasputin was there, and everyone was just waiting for the czar to come in, uh, and, you know, there's Rasputin, and I guess you can smell him coming around the corner. Uh, there he is, and, uh, you know, uh, everybody's just sitting there pleasantly waiting, and Rasputin's looking, and he gets tired of it, and he just uh, takes his fingers, his hands, and he probably had never washed his hands, and instead of using a spoon, he just puts it in the bowl and just starts slurping it up. And everybody's just appalled. And people look down the table and he's got this, you can see his beard, he's got this long beard hovering over that bowl. And they observe while he's eating that soup, there are lice falling out of his beard into the soup. Okay, so when I say he's filthy, uh, he's filthy. But he gets an enormous amount of power. And if you could get a little piece of paper from him that said, do this for me, do this for me, Gregory, and take that to the Tsarina, you could get just about anything you wanted. And these Russian nobles did just about anything to get one of those pieces of paper. Rasputin becomes fairly wealthy. He charges them a lot of money. Uh, he also, when he gets all the money that he wants, he would look at them and say, hey, your daughter, your oldest daughter, she's a very attractive young lady. And he would want the man that he'd be allowed to sleep with her uh, to pay for one of these little pieces of paper that said, do this, do this for me. So, you know, he's running quite a racket. The Tsarina makes, makes him a bishop or something high up in the church. She gives him his own church. Uh, he sits there in the window of the church, looking out over the town square in St. Petersburg, a couple of soldiers over each shoulder. When he sees a woman, an attractive woman, woman passing by, he will simply send soldiers out to get her and drag her in, kicking and screaming, and rape her, rape her right there in the church. One story was that he raped a nun in the church, uh, and um, the uh, bishop uh, of that particular parish uh, called him in and made him kneel in front of him and he beat him with a wooden cross and of course Rasputin ran out and he went immediately to the Tsarina and told her what had happened and that bishop you know got sent off to Siberia or some other foreign far 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 away place. Well of all the nations that entered World War I uh, Russia probably had the most to lose. Uh, they had a massive 15 million, get this down, they had a massive 15 million man army. 
Russia had a massive 15 million man army. And they looked good on paper. You know, the Russian military looked very powerful on paper. In fact, it was called, I'll get this down, the Russian steamroller. Okay? And the French and the British expected this to happen. But look at this. The French and the British expected the war to go like this. Once we declare war against Germany, Russia will declare war against Germany, and we will simply hold the Germans back on the Western Front, and 15 million Russian soldiers will come storming in on the rear of the, of the uh, Central Powers and crush them, and the war will be over. Well, that's what they planned to do. But get this down, the Russian military was not nearly uh, as powerful as it looked. Uh, they were poorly equipped. They were a little peasant army. They didn't have any gas masks. They didn't even have helmets. They wore little leather caps, <laughs> many of them. What it amounted to was a peasant army marching into the first modern war in history. There are 15 million of them, but they've only got 4 million rifles, and a lot of the rifles don't have any ammunition. The idea of the Russian army was, we're going to put all the men who have rifles on the front rank, and everyone else is going to line up behind them, uh, and we will attack the enemy, and when the man in front of you carrying the rifle gets shot down, you pick up the rifle and you keep going. And when that man's shot down, the next man that picks up the rifle and you keep going. A lot of these men were sent into battle with sticks. Imagine going against these machine guns with sticks. And uh, they would uh, line them up on, uh, you know, on one side of the hill. Here would be thousands of soldiers and the enemy would be here dug in and we're gonna send you up over this hill to attack. They literally didn't have any weapons. And they would uh, put Russian Orthodox priests, Russian, the Eastern Orthodox Church is a branch of Catholicism. Uh, they would put these uh, Russian priests up in the truck with vials of holy water, and they would drive them between the ranks of the soldiers, and they would be sprinkling them with holy water just before they sent them over the hill to charge machine guns with sticks. And, of course, they're going to be slaughtered. I'm only going to talk about one battle, and I'm not even going to talk about it. I'm just going to list one battle. We'll get this down from the Eastern Front. Did you see that right there? Right there? The Battle of... Hannenberg, okay, write that down. That's on the Eastern Front. And it's a perfect example. Is that E R G S E R G? Yeah. It's a per Tannenberg is a perfect example of what happened to the Russian army during World War I. Uh, the uh, uh, four weeks into the war, just the war, Russia had just declared war four weeks before this, and uh, the, the Russian generals ordered their men to attack. A German position. And get this down, uh, in a couple of days, 160,000 Russians were killed. 160,000 Russians were mowed down. In fact, the German gunners killed so many Russians that the piles of bodies were stacking up in front of the Russian machine, uh, excuse me, the German machine guns, and they couldn't get a clear line of fire to kill more Russians. And so the, the, the German gunners would stop firing and they would go out in front of their trenches and they would kick down the bodies, the piles of bodies, so they could level off again and have a clear line of fire to kill more Germans. This was such a disaster that the commander of the Russian army at this battle, a general named Alexander Samsonov, uh, when the battle was over, you know, he was so disheartened having sent, sent 160,000 men to their deaths, he walked out into the woods and he shot himself. My point is this, if this now, Russia enters the war in 1914, and by 1916, five million Russians, think about that, five million Russians had been killed and wounded. And also think about this, in 1917, the Russian Revolution starts. The war was a disaster. You know, the Romanov dynasty was set to rule Russia for 300 more years until World War I came along. Get this down. World War I caused the Russian Revolution. It caused the Russian Revolution. And of course, with the war going to hell in a handbasket, as they used to say, the Tsar and the little Tsarvich, there's a better picture of Rasputin, <coughs> the Tsar, and there they are. There's the little Tsarvich, dressed just like Dad. There's the Tsar. There are his generals. They immediately went 
to the eastern front. They go to the eastern, they leave St. Petersburg here, and they go to the eastern front to try and stabilize things, and that was a huge mistake as well. Because now, get this down, the Tsar is in command of the Russian army. And anything that, that goes wrong, it's not going to be blamed on a group of generals. It's going to be blamed on the Tsar himself. He's going to be blamed for the disaster uh, that uh, is World War I. And, and get this down. This disaster in World War I, these 5 million dead and wounded Russians, uh, that's going to break this bond. Uh, that had existed for 300 years between the Tsar and his people. That's going to break this idea that the Tsar is here to protect us. And the Russian people, in the midst of this war, this disaster, will eventually, will finally rise up, and they will overthrow the Tsar. And by the way, I want you to get this down too. For many years, not just in World, when World War I started, but for many years, there had been groups in Russia, get this down, groups, who wanted to overthrow the Tsar, who wanted to get rid of the monarchy and create a new government. Socialists, that was one group. Socialists. <clears throat> Communists, okay, Communists were there. And a group called the Bolsheviks. Now today, Bolshevism, get this now, Bolsheviks, Bolshevism is synonymous with communism. And I think the best way here that I can describe this to you is to tell you that Bolshevism, the Bolsheviks, were an extreme version of, of the communists, okay? You with me? An extreme version of the communists. And these are the people right here, the Bolsheviks, who are going to ignite the Russian Revolution. So these groups for many years have been working to overthrow the Tsar. And then the war, and, and of course, people have, even though people in Russia suffered, people had largely rejected them. Are you crazy? God sends the Tsar to protect us if you want us to rise up and overthrow the Tsar? That's insane. But when the war came, when the war came, uh, more and more people uh, started to join these, quote, extremist or radical movements. Well, the winter of 1916-1917, get this now, the winter of 1916-1917 was one of the worst in history. Now, if you talk about a Russian winter being one of the worst in history, you're talking about uh, a winter that's almost unimaginable. You're talking about temperatures of 70 degrees below zero. Uh, and there were food shortages by this point. Millions of people were dead in the war. The war was being lost. And get this down, protests break out in the streets of St. Petersburg. Stop the war. Stop the war. And of course, the Tsar is away at the front, but his relatives, Russian nobles, come to the Tsarina, and they beg her to open up warehouses where there was food stored for the military. They beg her to open up warehouses to feed the people. And of course, who by this point has become her chief advisor? Rasputin. Rasputin, okay. And so she goes to Rasputin, you know, what should I do? And Rasputin said, don't open up the warehouses. If you let these people, you know, you've got a protest today. If you let these people pressure you into giving them what they want, there will be 10,000 protests tomorrow. He said, you've got to meet force with force. Send out the Cossacks. The Cossacks were the Russian cavalry. They wore big fur caps, the Cossacks. And uh, their trademark weapon, the Cossacks, their trademark weapon was that they had knotted ropes that hung over their sides. And in those knotted ropes, they had pieces of sharpened metal and glass. And they would ride among the people and literally lacerate, split your face and completely open and whip people with those ropes. And Rasputin said, send out the cavalry. Send out the Cossacks. Meet force with force. He actually said this to the Tsarina. He said, the Russian people love the feel of the whip, end quote. That's the only way to deal with it. The Russian people love the feel of the whip. And so that's what happened. And of course, just like 
uh, others have predicted, when they open fire, when they shoot down these protesters, when they whip them and beat them, the number of protesters grow. And the next thing, get this down, you know you've got a revolution out there in the streets of Bruin. You've got a revolution brewing. And so with things spinning out of control, uh, one of the czar's uh, relatives, uh, this man, that's the czar's niece, uh, Princess Irina, she was considered to be the most beautiful woman in Russia. That's her husband. She's the niece of the czar, uh, but her husband through marriage is kin to the czar, and he may have been the wealthiest man in Russia. He may have been, have been the Bill Gates of his day. And they're watching this. People like them are watching the situation unfold. And they say, if there's a revolution, who are going to be the first people who go to the chopping, whose heads go to the chopping block? Who are these peasants going to overthrow and kill? The world. Which people, huh? The world. Them, yes, the people at the very top. The people at the very top. And so he says, he comes up with this idea, the key to avoiding the revolution, get this down, is to what? What do we got to do here? Well, that's a broad, open-ended question, but what do we got to do? How can we stop this revolution? Give the people what they want. Nope. He's not for that. Kill Rasputin. The reason that, you understand, the reason this situation is unraveling is because the Tsarina won't listen to anybody but Rasputin. So we got to kill, we got to kill Rasputin. If we don't get rid of him, there will be a revolution. And the Russian people will kill us. And so we hatched a murder plot in December of 1916. Okay. He, he hatched a murder plot in December of 1916. And he had this big, beautiful home and saying, there it is. I think it's still there. I forget how many rooms it has. I just want to show you how Russian royalty did. I showed you those, I showed you those Russian peasants, didn't I? The thatch on the roof that they ate. Well, that's the main entryway into that palace. That's the main entryway. That's just the entryway to this. I forget how many rooms. It might have had a thousand rooms. I don't know. There it is. And um, so uh, Felix Yusopov was his name. You don't have to write that down. But Felix Yusopov sent an invitation to Rasputin. He said, I'm going to have a party, a, so a social event at my house. <laughs> And um, I want you to come to it. Well, believe it or not, Rasputin was not a big party animal. He said, no, I don't want to come to it. He didn't like being around people that much. And Yusopov was almost begging and finally the thing that convinced Rasputin to come. And here's this big palace. Uh, Yusopov said, look, you don't have to come and meet all those people that are going to be there. Just come, and he said, I've got an entrance here, a private entrance, and you can come down into the basement. Now, it's not a basement like you're used to with one of those spider webs and canned goods and kerosene lamps where you go in the said, This was a beautiful, beautiful room. I guess today they would call it his man cave. It had thick white carpet. It had chandeliers. It had hand-carved fireplaces. It had a big white bearskin rug in front of the uh, fireplace overstuffed chairs. I mean, you can imagine what this room would be like just looking at the entrance to this house. And Rasputin said, I don't know how to that. And finally he said, well, you know, he wants to get rid of it. He says, you know, if you'll come, he said, I can just about guarantee you some private time with my wife. And the most beautiful girl in Russia. And at that, Rasputin said, what? What? What time? I'll be there. Okay. So anyway, uh, Yusopov gets this in. So he makes sure that all the servants are gone. And then him, and a doctor, and one of his friends are the only three people in the house. And they uh, are going to kill Rasputin. And uh, they take cyanide. You understand? This was cyanide. I could probably do this. Kill all of us. Uh, and it comes in liquid form. But anyway, he put cyanide in a bottle of wine, I mean a lot of cyanide, 
and they cook some cookies or brownies or some sort of pastry and they injected cyanide into it. And they built a big fire in the fireplace and they put a table there and a big old stuffed couch at the fireplace. And there was poison wine and paste, pastry there and Rasputin shows up and comes in this private entrance and sits down and you saw Papa's there and he this is really uh, upstairs, you know, he's got to make it sound like they're people. So they had a record player and they only had one record and it's Yankee did da 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 and they just keep playing that one record and people those other two guys are shuffling their feet, they're laughing, you know, like trying to make it seem like there are five hundred people up there. And Rasputin's completely uninterested in that, but uh, the soap office down in the basement, he says, you know, drink some wine. And Rasputin says, oh, well, you know, he takes a drink, and of course, the soap office expects him just to drop dead like that. And he does it. Well, he eats some pastry, he eats some pastry, you know, there's enough in there to kill a bull elephant. And uh, he does it. And so, very nervous. He stops off and says, I'll see you right back. And he goes upstairs and I guess he grabs that doctor and says, I thought she said you put enough cyanide in there to kill a bull elephant. He's down there drinking all that wine, eating all that pastry, and he's still alive. And so they said, well, you've got to shoot him. So he goes downstairs with a gun. And when he gets down there, Rasputin is standing in front of the fireplace. Now, this is what you saw off said. I'm giving you his account. And they stand there warming his hands at the fire. And, uh, uh, Yusupov says, Gregory Rasputin, say your prayers. You know, he's behind him. He goes, what? And bam, bam, he shot him. He's been poisoned and he's shot twice. And he falls on this rug and yip, like a little dog, to be a horrible example, but a little dog being shot with that little yip. And uh, you know, Yusupov walks over. And by the way, he's 6'2". He's a big, long character. So he goes upstairs and he says, you know, I've got to have some help with the body out of here. We've got to get rid of this guy. And they go back downstairs, Rasputin was up on his all fours. And he was <sighs> like a wounded animal. And he lets out this ferocious yell and goes scrambling up. And they, there are three of them, Rasputin's been poisoned and shot twice. <laughs> and they sort of scream and go running up the stairs with Rasputin chasing them. And they run down a long hallway, and my student is staggering toward the door. And those guys are run, running forever. But Rasputin said, holding on to the door, you know, trying to get out and yells after them, I'll tell the Tsarina everything. I'm going to tell them. And as scared as they were, that stopped them. And they come back, and by this time, Rasputin is staggered out of the coal yard. This is December. It's bitterly, bitterly cold. The snow is that deep. And Rasputin is staggering, and they shoot him three more times, and he falls. They drag him back in. They yank down these curtains. They tie his hands up with the cords off the curtains, and they wrap him in the curtains. And just for good measure, there's a heavy brass lamp or barbells, one or the other, and they bash in the front of the skull, bash in the front of the skull, and then they take him out and chop a hole in the ice in the Neva River and just stick him in there. A few days later, there are some ice fishermen. They're fishing, and I'm sure they're going to go out of your car. Ah, oh, it's Rasputin. They pulled him out. And, uh, you know, there are all sorts of rumors associated with his death. One rumor, or one legend, I guess you could call it, that has survived the years, is that when they did an autopsy on him, he was, uh, his lungs had water in it, which, which would have meant, <coughs> Pardon me, which would have meant after being poisoned and shot four times, having the skull bashed in when they stuck him in the water. What? Yeah. He was still alive because he had to, had to suck in that water. And his official cause of death would have been drowned. He was a tough old boy. Um, but, uh, you know, probably what happened, they shot him in the back of the head and they stuffed him in the river uh, and they dragged him out. Uh, a fisherman finds him. Uh, and of course, that's. That's the end of, of Rasputin. Uh, he had written the, the Tsarina a letter a few weeks before this happened. And uh, he said this, and I quote, he said, I feel that I shall leave this life before January 1st. Well, that was true. He did. He did on December 16th. 
He said, if I am killed by common assassins, in other words, if just somebody off the street shoots me, you have nothing to fear. But if your relatives kill me, then no one in your family will remain alive for more than two years. They will all be killed by the Russian people, end quote, which is exactly what happened. It was exactly what happened. The Tsar's entire family is going to be killed by the Russian people. But, you know, Rasputin has a certain durability. Uh, he, uh, you know, in the 1970s, which may be the worst decade in history, in the 1970s when they had disco, we're not done this, but when they had disco, they actually wrote a song that people were dancing to about Rasputin. Uh, and it said, uh, they put some poison in his wine and drank it all and said, I feel fine. So, you know, uh, 50 years after his death, I guess he's making the top 10 music chart. Well, uh, watching all this then, watching these, I get this now, watching all this, the conditions deteriorate in Russia here, are the Germans, okay, get that down, are the Germans, they're watching this, and they see that Russia is on the peak, or not peak, excuse me, brink of a revolution. Russia's on the brink of a revolution. And they believe, the Germans, now we're talking about the Germans, the Germans believe that if a revolution breaks out in Russia, that will take Russia out of the war. And again, you've got to have a timeline here. This is 1916. They believe that this will take Russia out of the war. Uh, and if Russia, if Russia leaves the war, then the Germans can move about 2 million men that they had here on the Eastern Front. They can move them to the Western Front and achieve a breakthrough before who can arrive? The United States. Because, you know, Rasputin dies in December of 1916. The U.S. declares war in April, a few weeks later in April of 1917. So if we can start a revolution to take Russia out of the war, we can rapidly move all of these troops to the uh, Western Front and achieve a breakthrough before the Americans get here and win the war. And that almost works. Germany almost wins the war because the Germans are going to be largely responsible for starting a revolution in 1917 in Russia. And here's what they did. They need someone to start this revolution. And there's that someone. If there is a devil, that guy just looks chilling to me. If there is a devil, I think that's what he must look like. That man is the leader of the Russian Revolution. And he is the first communist dictator of the Soviet Union. Uh, and his name is Nikolai Lenin. Okay, Nikolai Lenin. Lenin. That's his pen name. Uh, his name is Vladimir Yulianov Ilyich. <clears throat> the, the name that he wrote under was Lenin. Okay? Lenin. And that's how you can remember him. One of the famous redheads of history. And for years, get this down, he had been trying to launch a revolution. In fact, he had dedicated his whole life up until this point to launching a revolution against the Tsar. In fact, uh, he was on the top wanted list of revolutionaries in Russia before World War I, and he had been forced, get this down, before the war ever started, he had been forced to free, flee from Russia to Switzerland. And that's where he was. Right here, look at this, there's Switzerland. He had fled from Russia to keep the Tsar's police from arresting him. He had fled from Russia to Switzerland, and that's where he was in 1917. And the Germans are going to get him. Get this down. The Germans are going to get him. The Germans are going to get him. And they're going to put him on a special train. And they're going to send him, transport him from Switzerland right up here to the Russian border. Here, this revolution uh, just needs a spark to ignite. Well, Lenin's going to be that spark. They bring him up here on a train. 
the cart is pulled, he's in that train car by himself, and they uncouple that train car on the Russian frontier, and they just push his train car across and then leave. It was almost like they had uh, loosed a plague, and in a sense, they had. Uh, and he gets out of that train car, and he makes his way up to St. Petersburg, which during the war had been changed to Petrograd. Petrograd. And he sets about to start a revolution. And he does. And uh, I'll talk about that more come tomorrow. Petrograd.